right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, I'm not sure what I'm going to do today, um, but I just thought I'd look at a couple of people, maybe pick on a couple of people, and just try to sort of expose the error and then show the truth. And, you know, this is typically what I like to do, right? And so let me start off by saying, or quoting, 1 John chapter 4 verse 6 we are of God he that knoweth God heareth us he that is not of God heareth not us hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error all right so we're gonna start off by showing the spirit of error and then hopefully I'll be able to show you the spirit of truth and uh, let me preface this by saying that hey I get it man I get it you know these guys right here that I'm going to show you they're they're learning they're trying to figure it out and they don't get it they don't quite get it some are further off than others but man I get it I get it they're they're searching but um, what I'm gonna tell you is that until you believe the Bible that you hold in your hands you're really restricting yourself you're limiting yourself and I want you to be free I want to free you from those limitations because look if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands then you're trusting what man says and I'm telling you you gotta trust God you got to trust God and the King James Bible is the Word of God It is directly from God Proverbs 30 verse 5 every word of God is pure he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him and of course Jesus says the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life the Word of God is not stuck in old languages and dead languages they're not there's no originals period Languages come and go, but the Word of God endures forever. And I think that's what uh, really people, they don't want to believe the Bible that they hold in their hands. They want to believe what Reverend Smitty says, God says. And, you know, I could make all kinds of, you know, uh, some you know uh, draw some similarities to when Moses received the Word of God written with the finger of God and he came down and men were worshiping a calf rather than God and we see this more today than ever before but all right before I get off topic here let's let's listen to what 144 rising through affliction the elect has to say. All right, Shalom, Israel. I like to say all praises to Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shai. Double harness to the elders oh, and great I'm meals. I'm sorry, I thought this was English. Is this not English? Hold on. All harness all the brethren out here doing the work and the will of the Father in truth and sincerity. And this is your fellow servant, Arya. Salakia. And as you can see, we're here in Revelation chapter 20. And about to get to understand it. So let's get into it. Gonna get through it as quick as possible. So this revelation oh, that, that is English. I'm sorry, I I can't understand a word he's saying. The twenty verse one. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. <clears throat> I, you know what? Just one little pet peeve of mine. 
Maybe it's my hearing. Let me play it again. Which is the devil and Satan. And Satan. 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 Say and see. I. <laughs> it's Satan. Say ten. Say ten. Satan. It is say ten, not say n. And maybe it's my ears. How do you pronounce Satan? Come on, man. Give me. A... Oh goodness sakes! I can't get. It's impossible to get anything you want on the internet. No, it won't even give me a definition. Usually, if I do that, I get a definition. What is it? How to pronounce it? How do you pronounce Satan? Satan. Satan. See, I, I'm making too big out of too big of a deal out of this, but that just drives me nuts. Satan. It's not Satan. It's Satan. And bound him a thousand years. Whatever. So that angel represents Israel, and it said he, and it said that it came down from heaven, having the key. Wait. 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 Israel. What? Satan. Wait a second. Now, I'm getting hung up on Satan. Satan. Maybe I do I make the same mistakes? It's Satan. And bound him a thousand years. So that angel represents Israel. And it's what? The angel represents Israel. That that's not even you're not even close, pal. What are you talking about? Satan represents, or a, a, the angel, <laughs> the angel represents. Good night. I, I cannot even begin to fathom to imagine where he got that from. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottom was put in a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him in the bottom of the pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years before. The... Where are you getting this idea that the angel represents Israel? I mean, that doesn't even begin to make any sense to me. In the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. I don't, I'm just not seeing it, man. It's like you pulled that out of thin air. Really? I mean, I could say. The angel of Revelation 20 represents Kellogg, Iowa. And I saw an angel. This angel represents Kellogg, Iowa. Come down from heaven. I don't know how Kellogg went from the earth to heaven, but nevertheless, having the key of the bottom of the ching in his hand. And Kellogg, Iowa laid hold on the dread. And this doesn't make any sense, Jack. Come on. In the city. And it said that it came down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. When you have the key to something, that means you have the power to enter and exit, meaning you control what's going on. All right, and it said that it had the control of the bottomless pit. That bottomless pit. Okay, all right. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not against that at all. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and great chain, and say, "He's got the key." Yeah. So he's got the uh, he's got the control and power to lock and unlock. All right, go along with that. Pit represents Europe. What? Right? So the hills. Ah, uh, that's it. No, I can't take it. the bottomless pit represents Europe. Well, I could say the bottomless pit represents Grinnell, Iowa, right? the town twenty miles to the east of here. I mean, really, what's the difference? The same, the same measure or whatever you want to call it that you're using for 
Israel and Europe would be the same that I'm using. It's complete imagination based on nothing at all. Now, I'll go back to Revelation 20 and make this real simple for you, but let's move on to somebody else. All right, decoding the deception. All right, let's decode the deception. I want to start with a question today. Where is Satan and what is he doing? Is he bound in the confines of a place that we can refer to as hell or the abyss or the, the, the bottomless pit? Or is he out roaming free? All right, so let's, that's a good question. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon and that old serpent, which is the devil, and bound him a thousand years. Now let's focus on this a little bit. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years be fulfilled. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so Satan roaming. Oh, what is that verse? Oh, I forget. I forget what that verse is. I'm way off. Uh, is this going to work? Nope. Let's do it this way. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. All right, just to get a little bit curious here. Like a roaring lion. The lion is a cat, and I'm a curious cat. And there we go, I amplified. I amplified and the GNT. What is the GNT? Good news translation? Don't tell me that. Oh my goodness sakes. All right, whatever. All right. Uh, who cares? I, I'm just, I find that curious that, that the word Rome roams. Uh, was being used and uh, I'm getting a, little, <laughs> getting a little bit I mean this is what I do right I mean I got to validate every word that is being used because there are so many deceivers out there I mean I don't know if you've had the experience I've had but the experience I've had is I've listened to people and I've remembered what they said and then later on it comes back to bite me in the butt because I go to look it up in the Bible and it's not there. Oh, I fell for a trap, man. I fell for a trap and I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what's going on because I listen to somebody else rather than reading and believing the Bible. All right, so that's why I want to get technical and evaluate and, and to make sure every word is correct all right wait a second let's do it this way here seeking whom he might devour on uh, first peter 5 7 about our ad wait maybe he's right let me go back casting all your care upon him for he cares for you oh I think he he meant 5 8 didn't he let me go and might devour on uh, uh, first Peter 5 7 about our adversary 5 8 all right yeah there we go yeah he's just remembering it adversary the devil prowling about like and that's line. not a big deal in my opinion <laughs> you're, you're off a verse or two that's not a big deal when you misquote entirely and out of context, that's a big deal. And seven, eight, that's not a big deal. And seeking whom he might devour. Is he attacking the saints and deceiving the nations, tempting us 
in air or is he bound in hell well the scriptures seem to talk about this two different ways and and so we're going to dig into that yeah no so you've got to rightly divide the word of truth you've got to rightly divide the oh my goodness you got to first read the bible and rightly man i could have sworn that was in the bible somewhere could have put my hand on the bible and sworn to god i could have it's right there the rightly dividing the word of truth what i do that's not i gotta learn english first that's what it is i gotta learn how to spell i i don't think i oh that's what it is so it's dividing i had a right that's looking weird to me see i've i just woke up drank my two cups of coffee and uh, i get I get kind of weird in the morning, which is the best time to to uh, study the Bible, in a way. Really, in a sense, it is because your mind is fresh, and then if you study the Bible before you go to bed, it's kind of tired, which isn't a bad time either. But it's nice to always look at the Bible in a fresh sort of way that's just my thoughts today and and what i've landed on and it's it's something that i'm going to dub a forest gump ism and we're going to seek to get that copyrighted although i do not think that we here at decoding the deception will have much success with that but the leak all right let me decode this deception right here whenever somebody quotes from the nkjv that tells me that they don't believe the Bible. <clears throat> you can't believe the Bible. Um, number one, the New King James Version is not a New King James Bible at all. It's a trick. And the sole purpose of this trick is to get you away from the King James Bible. Sole purpose. Now, if, uh, uh, <laughs> It used to be said that, I don't know if people are still saying it, but it used to be said that all the New King James Version does is take out the these and thous. And well, that's not true at all. Anybody can see that. That's not true at all. And in fact, when we evaluate or analyze, uh, when we collate it with all the the Bible versions, we see that uh, they do in fact get their translation from the Roman Catholic Church manuscripts and they side with modern versions as much as they side with the King James Bible it's not about the these and the thous it's about getting people away from the King James Bible and the these and the thous that's it's not hard to understand it's not hard to understand at all. In fact, when you when you look at it, the King James Bible is far easier to read, learn, and understand than the New King James Version. All right. So, uh, and that this is a problem right there. If you don't believe the Bible, you don't believe the Word of God. You don't believe the Word of God. You don't believe Jesus. Think about that legal team is is working on it a forest gump ism maybe it's both maybe it's both maybe he's bound and yet free and and how do we understand that then and and even here and and we could talk about the totality of the scriptures and and what they say but even if we just limit it to the confines of the book of Revelation we have we have this tension that exists between what we are told in Revelation 9 about an angel being cast down and locked in a pit but he's given 
the key to the pit. Go back and watch the two videos on that. I'll pop them on the screen right now and they're in the, the links to those are in the description below. And I do highly recommend that because understanding all of this rightly, we need to understand chapter 20 in the light of chapter 9 and chapter 9 in the light of, of chapter 20. <laughs> Is he there? What? Found there. Yeah. Goodness sakes, I can't, I can't let that go. I cannot let that go. All right, so let's go to Revelation chapter 1, the very first verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. All right, let me say this another way. The angel shows John things, right? The angel shows John things. <laughs> the angel, the angels show John things. In uh, we got to go back. Okay, but w just to look at the very beginning of Revelation 9, we see the fifth angel. All right. So, was there a fourth angel? Of course there was. Now, what are these? Uh, what is this? In, what is the context of this? And, of course, it is the seven trumpets. Now, how do we go backwards here? There we go. Now, and I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Right? The seven trumpets. These are the wrath of God being poured upon the earth. Okay? Now, you heard me uh, say this many times before. Um, it is very, very important to understand the end time eschatology, if you will, that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world, and that the angels of heaven will gather us together, will be lifted up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. This is all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, talks about the same thing. When Jesus comes, it's the end of the world. So when you read the book of Revelation, you can't forget that. If you understand this, then you can begin to understand the book of Revelation. And therefore, when you read about the seven trumpets, then you ought to know that this is when we are up in the air. And this is when the wrath of God comes down upon the people. This is equivalent to what we read in Genesis 3 verse 15 when it says, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent all right this is the same thing the same event the same moment in time and of course this is told to us in another way that we might understand and first angel second angel third angel fourth angel and then of course we get to Revelation 9 the fifth angel now, you're going to have a problem when you say this is the same as Revelation 20. Let's give him a chance to talk a little more. There, as in chapter 9, well, more accurately, sorry, I got that wrong. Is he, as it is in chapter 9, he's got a key to the bottomless pit, which is the abyss, and smoke is issuing forth, and then those horrible locust things come out, or is it as we see here in Revelation 20, that he is bound. So, what we're going to do today, we're just focusing on Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And in doing this, we're going to isolate the terms that are key 
understanding all of this and then once we have that understanding then we're ready to interpret all these things and and pull it all together and and i will remind you i'm putting the picture up on the screen now of that gem in a hand and understanding that the book of revelation many parts of it we understand by the book being a gem it is you can look at it different ways and when you turn it in your hand and the light refracts off of the gem we see different things we can see the same thing from different angles see i like that so you've heard me say um we are every time uh, a vision is shown to john it's a different picture that's being painted well he's saying the same thing that when we look at this gem i don't know if is that a diamond is that real i don't know but it doesn't matter so we see the same thing from one angle the light reflects one way and then you turn it and the light reflects another way we're looking at the same thing but we're seeing it different and that's that's what i'm saying when each time an angel shows john this vision it's a new painting a new picture if you will a new image that john is seeing and describing for us but it's always about the same thing and that's why that's again this is why i say it's so important to understand that jesus explains the end time better than anybody and if you can understand the simplicity of this that when jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world and we are lifted up in the air if you can understand that then then you can begin to understand the book of revelation it's really that simple but you know when you start saying oh the angel represents israel and the bottomless pit represents europe man, you're way off man you're way off you're not even close you're you're not even the left field you're beyond the bullpen all right so that's what we're going to talk about today and certainly want to get us off to our traditional start hello and welcome this is matthias 76 together we are decoding the deception here today in Revelation 20, a chapter that, that we might refer to as the misunderstood millennium. Because from what I see, from what I read, from what I hear, much of the teaching on the thousand years is not in line with what the text really says. Now that's 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 a good job right there because I absolutely agree and really man so many people are teaching this incorrectly so much so that what they're teaching is pure evil all right and they're not trusting the word of God they're trusting Nicolas Cage in a Hollywood movie called The Left Behind no. If you would have read Matthew 24 and believed the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, then you should understand Revelation 20, the thousand years are right now, and at the end of the thousand years is the end of the world. And then once you understand that, then everything makes sense. Yeah, I mean, who's the first resurrection? I know people have problems with that. I, if you have a problem with that you really you're, you have a problem with Jesus Christ that's what you got a problem with all right you don't have a problem with me you don't have a problem with the text you have a problem with Jesus Christ he makes it very plain very clear when he says I am the resurrection He's not lying. People that say this is different, they're the liars. Jesus is the first resurrection. We that are born of God are partakers of his resurrection. All right. 
I and look, I get it. I I got tricked. I got deceived. I got lied to. I believe the lie instead of believing the book. I done it all, man. I get it. But man, this has got to stop. It's gonna stop, and it, the when Jesus comes, this is gonna prove out that Jesus was right the whole time. The whole entire time, the Lord Jesus had it right, and men got it all wrong. Jesus is the first resurrection. Afterward, they that are Christ, that is coming. He is the first resurrection. Right now, we that are born of God, the second death has no power over us. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The second death has no power over us that are born of God. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Anybody seeing it? The second death has no power over us right now. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. First Peter chapter 3, I think, or 4, or 2. Or somewhere in the Bible it says something. Oh, I'm way off. Where is it? First Peter 2, 3 Peter 1. I'm way. I don't know. I don't know where it says. Somewhere I thought it said something. Let's see, I, I can't remember nothing. Where's it at? First. Well, I thought I was just at First Peter two. There it is. <laughs> Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Right? See, so look at that. Compare this with what we're reading in Revelation 20. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Now, if you don't think that we're a priest of God right now, then just go ahead and admit it that you believe this is a lie. First Peter chapter 2 is an absolute lie. Right. You might as well call Jesus Christ a liar while you're at it. All right, and what what are you talking about calling Jesus Christ a liar? Well, that's what you're saying. You're saying that Jesus Christ is a liar. You might as well call him a bald faced liar while you're at it. What's the difference? In Exodus 19, Jesus says something. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and unholy nations. I said that goofy. Ye shall be me. Ye shall be me. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, who said that? Jesus said it. Jesus is God Almighty. Make no mistake about that. There aren't two gods. There's one God and it's Jesus. He says, You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Right here in 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a royal priesthood. Revelation 20, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him. Right now, we are priests of God. Right now. What's it say in Revelation chapter 1? He has made us kings and priests unto God. You can't get around that. Your only choice is to call Jesus a bald-faced liar. That's all you're left with. So let's jump in and I will read the three verses and then we're going to go through them and talk about it in detail. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more 
till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, just at the outset here, many, yea, most, take this thousand years that Satan is bound and think that it is at the end of all things, that there's some special epoch of history where this takes place. That comes from Darby, it comes from Schofield, and it has nothing, nothing to do with what the text says. It is. That's right. I mean, he's exactly right. Now, just in case you're wondering, I have not watched this, right? So this, I'm watching this for the first time with you but he's exactly right on that point the idea that this happens after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven uh, it's n nonsense it's it's evil and it's stupid it can't and it, you wonder why am I so fired up well be, it's one it's evil because you're teaching children that they can wait until after the Lord Jesus comes to believe in him that's as evil as anything being taught in the world today and another part of it is that I myself got sucked into the many lies associated with Revelation 20 right and the more I study this and read this and learn this and all that sort of stuff the more I realize hey if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he's gonna save you you ought to know what he's gonna save you from and of course he's gonna save us from not just death but he's gonna also give us everlasting life that's what we're putting our hope into a life where there is no more sin at all so when Jesus comes that's the end of sin forever he's gonna destroy it all it, to put your hope into anything else is pure evil when Jesus comes it's the end and I see so many people not teaching this do you can you really say that you're saved if you are putting your hope into a that a bonus thousand years okay, I don't want the thousand years you can take that thousand years and shove it up your yin yang I don't want it I want everlasting life without any sin whatsoever and Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and that's it it's over it's done it's finished he's gonna make all things new at that moment in time okay so I get fired up about this is an false interpretation imposed upon the text, forced upon the text. And if we do sound biblical interpretation, which is where we go in, look at the setting, look at the terms, see how they're used, make sure we're interpreting the word angel here in a coherent manner, the key to the bottomless pit in an coherent manner, meaning that the way we look at these terms here needs to take into consideration how the term is used in other places. That applies to chain, other things. We need to do it in a way that is consistent. And if we don't interpret the scriptures in a way that is consistent, then you can, with flights of fancy, Take the Word of God and make it say whatever you want. And and we that that ah, that's that's what you're doing. Also, you yeah, you don't want to be a hypocrite here, Mister Decoding the Deception, because when you quote the NKJV, that you're playing the same trick. You do the same thing. Because what you say is, well, this isn't the Word of God. you got to go back to the Greek and the Hebrew, which there is no, uh, what do you call that, a gold standard. There is no original 
Bible in those languages, period. You're not pointing to anything. What you're doing is saying, well, you got to take this word from the English and then translate it into the Greek and the Hebrew and then retranslate it back into the English using all the available variables that show associated with that word. It's a trick. The same trick that the serpent pulled in Genesis 3 when he said to Eve, Yea, has God said? Getting Eve to doubt the Word of God. And again, I'll say this over and over and never tire. The Bible that you hold in your hands, the King James Bible, it is directly from God. It's not man's interpretation, it's not man's translation. It has really nothing at all to do with man whatsoever other than men wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible is from God and just as God gave Moses tables of stone written with the finger of God, the Word of God came directly from God to Moses, so also does our Bible come directly from God. Languages come and go, but the word of the Lord endures forever. So he's, it almost seems like, man, if he could just connect this dot and realize, hey, the Bible's true, and then, you know, I mean, get himself a King James Bible, right? The NKJV, man, doggone it. I got fooled by it too. But it's not the same as the King James Bible at all. Oh, it's a trick. And we don't want to go there. Then I saw an angel coming down out of heaven. Who is the angel? Who is the angel? Well, that term angel can be used in a lot of different ways, but the, the core significance of the term angel is that it is a messenger. A messenger and do not forget that in the Old Testament time and time again Jesus the pre-incarnate Christ is called the angel of the Lord all right okay the angel all right so I gotta I gotta stop it right here um, because he's he's gone so far off of topic that it's not going to, in my opinion, it's not going to help me, it's not going to help you. Right here, in Revelation 20, it's not rocket science. If you understand, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, all right, if you understand Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, the very first verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. If you understand that, then Revelation 20 is a piece of cake, and I saw an angel come down from heaven. This is an angel of our Lord Jesus Christ showing John a thing which must shortly come to pass. I mean, it's a vision. That's being shown to John by an angel. That's it. It's not rocket science, man. You don't have to point to uh, mysterious verses in the Old Testament. That's really, you're going too far off, man. You're going way too far off. It's not complicated. It's easy. All right, and then let's focus because I think a lot of people have the question, well, what about the serpent? Is he bound? Is he not bound? Well, the vision here is regarding the serpent, devil, Satan, dragon, bound for a thousand years. And why? Why is he? What, that's the big deal. Forget about what, you know, forget that he's bound. Just concentrate on why he's bound. Well, he's bound be so that he should deceive the nations no more. That's the context of him being bound. All right, this is not a contradiction in the rest of the Bible. Remember what I quoted earlier when I couldn't get the word right? It's 
study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Alright, so the context here of Satan being bound, we call him dragon, the old serpent, the devil, being bound for a thousand years is so that he should deceive the nations no more. Now think about this. If all this is true, and it is, then Satan was loosed, free, if you will, to deceive the nations before. And then for a thousand years, he's bound, he's locked up. And then after the thousand years, he's going to be free to deceive the nations once again. Right? So before he's bound, there was something going on that allowed him to be free to deceive the nations. Well, when we read the Old Testament, we understand that there was one uh, one nation of God one country if you will one group of people that were God's people outside of this circle of people were nations not God's people therefore Satan was allowed to deceive those nations outside of the nation of God and this goes back to the promises made to Abraham and there's a lot of places we could walk through this but um, if you think about Exodus 19 the children of Israel are or is the holy nation of God these are God's people outside of this are nations deceived by the devil by Satan by dragon by this old serpent all right does that make sense I mean it's pretty pretty easy pretty simple and now so what's the difference here when he's loosed after the end of the thousand years well what happens after the end of this world or when the this world comes to an end when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven then what happens well we are lifted up in the air think of all of us as the children of Israel think of all of us as the holy nation of God now we're plucked out of this world we're plucked out and plucked up and lifted up and all that is left on the earth are unsaved people are the people outside of the holy nation right if you think of Israel with boundaries inside the boundaries are the people of God and then outside of the boundaries are the people of Satan okay and then when Jesus comes the, all the people inside the boundary are lifted up and all you have are the unsaved people of Satan right and so why is he bound well when Jesus comes he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him right John 11 whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die believest thou this so now Jesus has made the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him right so th there's not a, like an Israel with borders and inside the borders are the children of God now those borders are wiped away and there are believers all around the world and because the kingdom of God is available to whoever or whosoever believes in him there are no more boundaries right so again when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven those of us that are 
his people are lifted up and so the only people left on the earth are unsaved people does that make sense so this is why Satan is bound for a thousand years and don't lose sight of the fact that in Matthew 24 Jesus says when he comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world and we are lifted up the angels gather together his elect we are lifted up in the air just like what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4 first the dead in Christ shall rise then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord right and just like what we read in 1 Corinthians 15 when he comes in the clouds of heaven then are we changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, the last trump, the last trump, right? And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. It's the same moment in time, the same sound of the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We're going to be transformed into our glorified bodies. We're going to put on immortality. And when this happens, when Jesus comes, and we are lifted up, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. All right, so we're separated from the tares, right? We are the wheat that is being separated from the tares. We are the sheep that is being separated from the goats. And we're up in the air with the Lord, and our enemy is destroyed forever. This is when. Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. All right, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Right? And just like what we read in Revelation 3, verse 9, where it says, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I love, have loved thee. God loves us, so he's going to lift us up out of this world, out of this wicked world. We're going to be lifted up, and our enemy is going to be gathered at our feet. And Jesus is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent. Or as in Revelation 20, verse 9, fire is going to come down from God out of heaven and devour them. It's the same thing. We're reading the same thing over and over all throughout the Bible. And so when this guy, he shows this image of this diamond or whatever, this gem, and he turns it, tilts it, and we see the same thing, but from different angles. Exactly what we're, it's a great analogy, if you will. This, we're reading the same thing from Genesis to Revelation. And that is, this world is coming to an end. And when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end. And we're putting our hope into a better world. Just like when Moses led his people out of the wickedness of Egypt, so also is Jesus Christ going to lead us out of the wickedness of this world into a better world into a world of everlasting life where there is no more sorrow no more crying no more tears no more death and no more pain all that's going to be done away with forever forever and ever we are going to have everlasting life with no more death, no more sin, no more wickedness, no more evil forever and ever and ever and ever. Jesus, when he said when he sat on upon a throne said, "Behold, I make all things new." And he said and he said unto me, "Write for these words are true and faithful." We're putting our hope into everlasting life all right so you can take that thousand year theories of yours and shove them up your yin yang i don't want no part of this none whatsoever take that thousand years and shove it right 
I don't want it. I want eternal life without evil. Period. 